Welcome back to Wait Your Turn everyone, I'm Jordan and today we're looking at a very special topic that I spent all weekend working on and that is Kingdom Death Miniatures. How miniature are they? No, just kidding, that's not the topic. So today we're going to be talking about assembly tips, warnings, and tricks that you can use when you're assembling your newly gotten Kingdom Death Miniatures. Stick around. really they're really tiny today we're gonna to be talking about how to assemble them the tips the tricks the warnings that you should know and be aware of before you go and dive into kingdom death monster so without any further ado let's get into it kingdom death monster miniatures what should you expect three two one what's up everyone all right so we have my whole army of kingdom death monster miniatures in front of me and so before we move on to the hard plastic and then even the painted version versions of the miniatures that we have here, let's start with the very bare basics of what you, as a viewer, will need to get into model building, miniature making, and miniature painting. Um, I'm also fairly new to this. I haven't done this for more than a year, uh, probably less than, uh, what is it, maybe six months or so, something like that. So I'm also a novice and amateur in, a, in, in many regards, but I also just want to share my personal experience uh, with working with these miniatures and the high quality and how it felt like for someone who basically just jumped straight into the deep end of miniature building, miniature making, and painting, and just how that felt for me, any hurdles that I came across along the way, to hopefully help you have have a smoother, more enjoyable experience. So these do not click into each other. They're not made to be very intuitive. At least in Kingdom Death Monsters' uh, method of production, it is very much uh, sink or swim. Um, so let's show you what I mean by that exactly. This is what I mean by sink or swim. So every single set of armor uh, or armor set that comes with the game. There's leather, there's rawhide, there's lantern, there's uh, iron, there's screaming armor for every single monster that you encounter and attempt to essentially disassemble in order to assemble your personal gear and weaponry that you need to survive in the darkness of Kingdom Death Monster. Everything that you need and don't need is here on these uh, basically reams of plastic miniatures. So as you can see, let's get a closer look. Um, you have shields, you have swords, you have little body parts here and there. In this case, this bottom torso is pretty much fully assembled uh, for your convenience. And sometimes it's maybe uh, the waist with two separate legs. Sometimes it's the waist and half a leg with another foot plus another leg. Sometimes even the lower half of the miniature is four separate pieces. So it can get pretty complex. And that's the easiest part. Uh, the next part in higher complexity are the arms. And so arms will typically be two pieces for one arm. And this isn't simply the upper part and the lower part, it's actually the upper part and then half of the wrist down or the forearm portion of uh, your arm. So there are tiny pieces and as you'll see up here, this is a wrist. <laughs> uh, I think the camera's having a hard time focusing on it, as well as your eyes probably should have a hard time focusing on it. But essentially, there are a lot, are a lot of tiny, excruciating pieces that you need to assemble. These are individual hands that uh, you <laughs> will likely be using uh, in this world. Luckily, you don't have to attach hands to weapons. Most weapons already have hands attached, which is something of a, uh, a convenience that every weapon benefits from. So, these are your raw materials that the Kickstarter, those million dollar Kickstarters, funded. And so how do you turn this into something functional like this? Well, fortunately, there are a lot of people who already went through the struggle, already went through the heartbreak of trying to assemble these and failing multiple times, and there are lots of resources out there. VibrantLantern.com is one that I, that I use regularly, and they're really good to just get you the bare basics. Um, by no means are those the end-all, be-all builds that you should follow. In fact, the glory and beauty and the brilliance of these kits, these terribly, unforgivably <laughs> uh, complex and modular assembly boards, is that you can truly build your own survivor. You can customize the shield, you can customize the clothes, whether the top half is phoenix, the bottom half is white lion. What I mean is in terms of poses, positions, the body language that you're trying to convey, you can do a lot of things with these armor kits. And so I'll show you a couple of my early beginning 
armor sets that I've built early on when I first start this, started this game because ideally you want to balance the gender ratios because you might have four female survivors battling, you might have four male survivors battling, and you just want it to be balanced and at least realistic in terms of gender. After that you can build based on what type of equipment they're holding, whether that's representing a whole rawhide set, whether that's representing a whole leather set or something like that. But I think the easiest thing to start with is first off creating four male and four female survivors and then after that building survivors based on weapon type because that is the most visual or um, eye-catching aspect of your miniatures is the weapon. The actual clothing that they wear that's purely aesthetic and you can play around with that and do a lot of fun things with that but we'll get into that in a little bit. So you have the raw materials you have the plastic bits and so what do you actually need to start transforming those into, let's say, this lantern glaive holding uh, piece of plastic. Well, in order to get started, there are a lot of options online. There's a lot of people trying to sell you a lot of different things in order to make sure they can make a quick buck off your predicament. The easiest thing that you can get is probably you can get everything that you need to assemble for $10. But everything I'll show you here is cheap. It's effective, it works well, and at least it, it helped me assemble all these miniatures. And then when you get a closer look at these miniatures yourself, you can be the judge for yourself whether uh, this is the route for you. But this is just for me, and this is what's worked well. So one of these things that you'll need, the first thing you'll need is a solid base. Uh, this is a pizza board. This is the top of a pizza box that, as you can see, I've used for a lot of painting. And you can see remnants of plastic cement for gluing that I've done as well, all this uh, scraggly spiderweb stuff. And so once you have this surface all set up, you'll put your plastic sheet on top of it, like so, and then you'll need an X-Acto knife. Um, an X-Acto knife is I mean, pretty cheap, you can find them at any hobby store. The blades themselves are detachable, so you can constantly reuse it, like so. Probably a pack of four blades is probably about five dollars or something like that, maybe even less, maybe even more. And then essentially all you do, and this is an important part, is when you're separating these pieces, these pieces are so small. They're ridiculously small. They'll go flying off into the carpet and you'll never see them again. All right, maybe you should. You should definitely put in the effort to try and find them if they drop off the table. But then you just put your finger on one of these pieces, line up the blade, and this is the tricky part. Sometimes you wanna line up your blade as close to the piece of equipment as possible. Sometimes you wanna give it a little bit of extra material. So if you're just starting out and you're not sure where to cut, it's best to honestly leave a little bit of extra plastic. So cut lower on the sprue rather than closer to the equipment because sometimes you might need that extra material in order to actually connect it properly. But even if you do mess up, don't worry because usually your plastic cement or whatever adhesive you're using will be able to fill in some gaps. For most of the hands, sometimes you want to leave some extra material, but usually for the, the weapons and the equipment, you want to cut to as close to the equipment as possible to get that clean cut. And it's okay, if you cut too more or too little, that's why you have this file. And so this file, this is used for cutting off or filing down remnants of sprues, it's for rounding corners or kind of obliterating defects that you've made. This is your friend. And you can get this from any store for about a dollar, a US American dollar at any convenience store, maybe even hobby shops, but I wouldn't go to hobby shops for this. This is what I use on my own nails actually. So believe it or not, hang nails, and lives. So <laughs> this biological reasoning uh, saves lives. So th these are literally the only materials you need. Of course, this is the most expensive material that you'll actually need, but an X-Acto knife, some blades, a file, a pizza board, hopefully you eat pizza maybe, maybe vegan pizza or something, and some plastic cement. And so this plastic cement, this is the trickiest uh, material of the whole thing. The plastic miniatures, they're forgivable, they're already formed, but this, <laughs> as some of you know, I bought my Kingdom Death monster off eBay, and the person who sold it to me was kind enough to put their own plastic cement in their box. Obviously, they were too frustrated to, uh, <laughs> to continue assembling or attempting to assemble their miniatures, and so they just dumped it all on me, for which I am very grateful, because I really wouldn't know where to get this, because this is Testers cement for plastic models. So plastic cement, 
I guess it's made for miniatures, and this looks very cheap. In fact, it's also a little bit toxic, which I found out when I started using these miniatures. This stuff will give you a nasty headache. Um, it actually has danger, but it was covered by the price tag, so I didn't actually read the danger uh, warning on the on the <laughs> on the package, and it gave me some nasty headaches for about a week. So my advice to you is use this either outside <laughs> or in a very ventilated room. What I mean by ventilated is not just leaving the window open because that's what I did. I thought I was smart. What I mean by ventilated is you have a fan blowing in your direction past your face or where this glue is. You make sure that you can't even smell this. That's what I mean by well ventilated or else uh, if it is a toxic type of plastic cement, you'll have a nasty a side effect of your hobby, which is not good and probably will reduce your test scores. So once you have these three basic supplies, you have your Kingdom Death miniature miniatures, let me show you a basic cut. So let's take this um this this wrist over here. So you see this tiny rectangle that looks almost like a defect or some mistake that they included. The first thing you should do is hold it down with a free index finger. You want to hold it down, press down on it just slightly, and then align your X-Acto knife with where you want to cut. Remember, cutting is permanent. <laughs> you are putting your desire into the plastic and it is a permanent uh, effect. When you cut, in this case for these wrists, you want to cut as close to it as possible. And all you have to do, it's, no, it's not a slicing motion, it's just an easy pressure. You can rock the knife back and forth a little bit and it is final and the cut is made. Once you have this tiny, minuscule bit of plastic, uh, you want to make sure that where you cut is smooth for easy attachment and then you'll just basically just glide it up and down on the file and presto, you have a new bit. I better not forget that I cut that piece or else I'll be sad in the future. But anyway, that is just a basic example of what you should expect in terms of material, in terms of effort, in terms of actual technique. And if you just follow that, you'll at least have some nice honed, polished parts to work with. Now, let's move on to actually, actually assembling these miniatures. So here's an example of a completely, well, not totally finished miniature. Uh, in this case, we have a dual-wielding lantern armor-wearing combatant with lantern greaves, a lantern sword, uh, back-held or reverse-held slip-gripped, I don't know, a lantern dagger in her left arm. She is ambidextrous or she's wearing battle paint, which allows her to dual-wield. So you can be really creative. And I definitely advise that you play the game a little bit. You see what actually is a feasible tactic or design in this game before you start building. In terms of parts that created this miniature, each leg is one part, the waist is two parts, the upper torso is two parts, the lantern necklace is one part, the arms are two parts, a piece, the head is, I think, four, three or four parts, one for the face, and then two or three more for the strands of hair on the back. These miniatures are pretty complex, and in terms of labor, um, it's probably about maybe a good hour or two hours per miniature. That is the type of commitment that uh, this game asks for. I surprised myself by how deep I got into this uh, miniature building aspect of the game. And it's very zen, it's very entertaining, and it's very fun. So let me show you some other examples. Along with the uh, starting armor sets that you have the freedom to totally customize, there's also these narrative sculptures as well. Um, these ones come with every core game. This one's Young Amy. I kind of added the axe on the back. Uh, it gave, gives a little balance to the piece. But essentially, um, these ones have rigid poses that there are also guides on Vibrant Lantern to build off of. And ult ultimately, as you can see, the detail speaks for itself. Uh, the quality is so good, and these are very sturdy pieces. Um, let's see, I don't know, I, I really have no worry about dropping them even though I don't like to, but these are very uh, solid pieces, and honestly the best in my collection, even though my collection isn't that big to actually begin with, so take that with a grain of salt. Um, I'll show you one more, and then I'll start showing you some of my uh, original pieces. As you can see, there's a huge diversity of different armor types and equipment that you can build, in this game. So in this case, we're dual wielding a lion claw katars. Uh, this is basically a whole white lion uh, gear setup with a skull helm on top of that. So there's a lot of elements going on. There's a lot of textures, as you can see. The camera can't handle the quality. 
And so, <laughs> um, there's so much to appreciate and really admire in these pieces. And so, as you can see, these stone face bases also add to each piece. And there's only a limited number that comes with each corset. So choose wisely which ones you use where. Some of these pieces, you will notice there are some defects on them. And that's also partially due to the very stringy quality of plastic cement. If you pull away, I mean, this, this very sturdy glue basically breaks out into small strings. And so basically, if you ever see those, you want to clear those and kind of basically pluck them away as quickly as possible before they dry and become basically solid spider webs covering your pieces. So be, be wary of that. Um, I'll show you one more from the set, one that I really enjoy and like. Um, this one's just a nice dual wielding dagger, uh, Phoenix Lady, <laughs> Phoenix Armor. And there's just so much kind of emotion that you can capture. My pro tip is just adding a nice little, you know, tilt of the head so it doesn't look as square up and down. And you are no, by no means limited to, you know, Phoenix armor going with Phoenix armor or rawhide armor going with rawhide armor. Let's see, that's some of the spider webs I was telling you about. But just do what works. And so this miniature is also, um, there's a deceptively large number of pieces. This one's a lot more simpler, but the head has three pieces. That braid I added in at, um, on my own. Um, the arms are two, th are three pieces each, one for the weapon in hand, one for the wrist, and one for the upper arm, which attaches at the shoulder. The body is two pieces. The legs are, I believe, three pieces, one for each leg, and then at that little tail feather at the back. So there's a lot. There's a lot to do, and it's a lot of fun. I, at the end of the day, it's a ton of fun. And then finally, let's see. I'll show you two more. I, <laughs> I really enjoy these miniatures. I really enjoyed making them this weekend, so that's why I just feel so incredibly beholden to all of you uh, today. So this one is another lantern armor. The lantern armor is my favorite armor set as uh, in total, and as well as the white lion armor. I really just enjoy all of it. So here you have a, a beacon shield, and there's a lantern cuirass, or some sort of kind of pauldron armor, a twilight sword in her left arm, a beacon shield in her right arm, and there's just so many details. First off, you have this two-part, uh, basically, Bowser cape wrapping around her shoulders, or three-part. You have her head, which is two parts, her body, which is two parts. Each leg is about, is yeah, just uh, one part. The sword, the shield, there's just so much that goes into each miniature, which is basically the fun of it. All right, so let me go ahead and show you some of the painted miniatures that I've, that I've cooked up over my time. So, the problem, at least for me, who's more or less a novice painter, the problem with having high quality miniatures is that it helps if you're a high quality painter as well. So this is one of my earlier painted miniatures when I just really didn't know what I was doing. I was just <laughs> attaching pieces here and there. You have the blood sheath with a rainbow katana. You have a bow on his back. And I stocked him up with as many arrows as I thought was possible, even though you can only basically carry one or two or maybe four arrows at a time. Uh, as you can see, it's sometimes hard for me to bring myself to paint because first, of course, you have to prime and then you have to paint over that, which both uh, serve to obliterate details as you go, which is kind of a sad, sad result because then you see when you compare these two miniatures together, um, the amount of detail is surprisingly uh, sparse in comparison, uh, both before versus the after effect. So sometimes I, I almost prefer to just leave them as they are because the detail is just more abundant in comparison. While the detail of the survivors um, kind of diminishes as you paint them, the detail on the actual monsters uh, basically flourishes as you paint them. So the simple details of a survivor, they kind of drop and decrease as you apply paint to them. But they are very fun to paint if I were, if I were a better painter. But these were some of my earlier miniatures that I painted when I first got the game also long ago. As for miniatures that truly flourish, let's show some of my some of the nemesis monsters from the game. So you have the hand and you have the Kingsman. The Kingsman was actually one of my favorite miniatures ever to paint. I really love uh, metallic elements to miniatures. I really enjoy the uh, parts of a miniature that really shine, what that has all the detail. There's still a little bit of plastic spider web on him, but there's a lot of bold colors that you can do. There's a lot of um, interesting elements and layers 
Oh, there's, what is that? What is that on you? Maybe it's dog hair. But anyway, the Kingsman was a ton of fun to paint. I mean, you have the leather on him, you have the metal, his halberd, uh, you have his cape and the color tones of that as well. There's just so much that you can imagine and create with these miniatures. And I feel like, at least with the monsters, perhaps I did them in, I was a bit of a better painter at the time, but you can really bring out those details with paint. So these were by far some of the most entertaining uh, miniatures to paint that I've ever, I've, I've ever dealt with, especially when you get really good at applying some different interesting layers. So that's the Kingsman that we're working with. Let me show you the hand. I really enjoy the, the level of detail. It just makes these miniatures just feel so much more lifelike and real. So this is a painted hand. You see his cerebral brain poking out of his head. You see his gilded armor, his, uh, his uh, scabbard and shield, his red pompous cape, the exotic fur collar. There's so many details that just draw your eye to these miniatures. It's just so fun to paint, just so rewarding. I'd say the miniatures alone, I, at first I wondered why not just make a cheaper version of this game without the miniatures, but I realized that these miniatures are so much a part of the game. The details that you can attack, the elements that you see on this miniature are actually things you can interact with in the game world, which is just so, so astonishing and just awesome. Just incredibly, incredibly entertaining and incredibly uh, realistic. So kudos to the Kingdom Death team. This game is really, really a cut above the rest. Moving on to some of the more, maybe the more classic uh, miniatures that you might see. We have the white lion, we have the screaming antelope, and of course I will finish this review with a talk about the phoenix, possibly the most fiendishly designed <laughs> uh, miniature to date. Here we have the Butcher. As you can see, uh, this was also a very early miniature, the Blood. Uh, I just went a little bit crazy with that, but he is the Butcher after all. So again, a very fun, interesting miniature. I, I wasn't very, <laughs> I wasn't really a master with the lighting or one source lighting or anything like that. So I really just poured that light all over and that was all dry brush brushing on the back. Uh, I'm not really talking about the brush techniques I did, but basically just have a tiny, sharp brush and apply effects according that way. So as you can see, the butcher cleavers are kind of oddly shaped, they're angled out, but they're actually meant to be like that. And the feet are, are also, they kind of have weird feet positioning for some of these miniatures, but I suppose in a way it's to make it more, more lifelike. As you can see, there are details on his back, lanterns you can hack at, bones and skulls and trophies from previous survivors you can liberate, and of course the cleavers that you can steal. So this game, really thrives on the details. As you can see, there's also bones and skulls. This one was actually really deceptively hard to paint and to get right because there's so many details. And I experimented with, with washes, but I don't. I learned from this game that I do not like washes because they also obliterate the details to an even greater extent than I really uh, wanted to work with. But I guess the washes work for his kind of dirty, sullied hands. So that's the butcher. Uh, you have some of the classic, uh, the Screaming Antelope, which is very fun, very simple miniature paint. The eyes took a little bit of work, but and uh, but the mouth came out really well. That's what I'm most proud about. I just did a little bit of pink on the bottom, and then I just used a brush and just lightly kind of splattered the gums a kind of a bloody red, and then the teeth were also very fun to go ahead and paint. So all in all, just very superb miniatures from start to finish, just very intriguing, interesting, and fun to paint. So, uh, one thing when I was a noob, I used way too much plastic cement to actually attach these miniatures to their bases, and that's a huge no-no. <laughs> don't, don't do it like me, but just a little bit of, a little bit of plastic cement so you can barely see it, but here I basically glued or like it almost looks like it's vanishing into the floor but you don't want to do that just a tiny bit of paint and just hold the miniature for a minute two minutes especially when it's a heavier one like the screaming antelope and it will stay it's surprising it's surprising to see what that plastic cement will actually do to hold these miniatures in place we have the white lion who's not lion i went ahead and did a black mane i did some of that screaming blood uh, crazy eyes and I really like the patchiness of the fur, kind of I did different textures. It kind of, 
I didn't really plan for that, but when I mix the colors, I always mix all my colors. It just came out that, oh my goodness, gotta censor that. But uh, put, put a few extra scratches. Not my finest work. Um, again, the guy who sold me this game um, uh, basically pre-assembled the starting survivors and the white line, and then before he or she was through with it. So um, I did not assemble this one, but I did paint it. And that was, I don't know, the white line, one of basically my favorite quarry to go ahead and hunt. But in terms of painting, uh, it's, it's pretty basic. It's a very nice starting paint job to get into to get it to get into Kingdom Death. But then as you get better as a painter, as a miniature builder, um, the sculpts that you build are more complex, as well as the paint that you can apply to them gets better and better. And finally, now lastly, as the creme de la creme, the Phoenix. So this one is I'm going to probably have to zoom out for this one, but this one is by far the most complex and intimidatingly complex miniature that I've ever worked with, that I've ever owned, possessed, dealt with, you name it. Um, I uh, took some inspiration from the internets in order to paint this one. And the Phoenix is <laughs> murderously uh, difficult. Um, I mean, it's not super difficult, it's manageable if you're patient, but it's it's difficult. And to paint, it's you just you don't want to get it wrong because it's just such a beautiful miniature. It's uh, it's probably the size was the size of my hand, basically, if not a little bit larger. And this the number of parts that go into this miniature. Imagine every single one of these hands is a separate bit of plastic that you have to glue in. Every single one of these hands and the different angles and positions uh, is important. And it's actually each hand is meant for each spot, which is even crazier because you have to uh, find <laughs> the guide on Vibrant Lantern is helpful. Thank goodness, and you just have to do one hand at a time. The actual body of the bird is a lot simpler. The beak, the face, uh, two wings attached, the legs, it all comes together in its own way, in its own time. Um, I used a guide, I, I used a paint reference for the kind of color palette that I went with. Very happy with how it turned out in the end, and you know, there's a face within the face, so terrifying, um, but in the end, super rewarding. Um, for most of my other miniatures that I've been showing you, it's just been a very simple, like, if it's leather, paint it brown, if it's skin, paint it Caucasian. And that's basically what I do. I mix most of my own colors. I use Vallejo, and um, that works for me. For this guy, though, I had to do something a little bit different. So as you can see, this color technique, how did I get those varying shades of red and orange and yellow? So it was a combination of things. First off, I painted the wings white. Um, and I ordinarily, I kind of feel I gravitate towards white primer, but I've been, I only, I've only used gray so far. In this case, I applied a couple different layers. So first it was a gray primer, then I used white. So I used white closer to the edges, and then I basically filled it out and I kind of, it was just like a very patchy white. So I did, it wasn't like completely white, but I just made it so I kind of just brushed it on as quick as I could to cover the whole wings. At first I thought I had ruined the miniature, but that was only the first layer in the grand scheme of things. So basically my idea was to make it a little lighter near the front and then darker towards the back. So I applied light paint up here to make it a kind of appear uh, that there was a light source coming on the wings in front and then it kind of fades into darkness as you move farther back. So I applied a white layer in that way and then after that I basically created a couple different shades of orange to red. So I started with a yellowish orange, I basically mixed yellow, orange, and, and a little tiny bit of red, that was just my color palette, and I just did the top uh, just these edges and I lined that with that and then I did a shade darker overlaying some of the yellower parts and then I did a shade darker moving back and then I did a shade darker moving back and I did a shade darker moving back and such and such. So I probably used about four different mixes. So you can see some of the lighter parts then the darker parts and then you can see the very dark ruddy old feathers that this phoenix has grown over its terrible lifetime. As you move back here uh, I'm not sure what happened there, <laughs> but it looks cool and I'm glad it did. But uh, sometimes when you're painting, just things just emerge from whatever nook and cranny. But I did not use any washes on this miniature, so it's all just matte paints, which is I'm very proud of and I'm glad I don't have to use uh, washes, I hate them. Um, but, and then I haven't colored this gray rock because I just want the rest of the miniature to stand out. I don't want the terrain to be the art piece, but I want the actual miniature to be cool. I did these kind of blue fingertips because I saw it online and I just thought, hey, if they can do it, I can do it, right? So uh, just a lot of patience, a lot of uh, patience. 
and then his teeth, his tongue, his beard. Um, a pro tip when you're assembling the Phoenix, make sure you don't uh, glue in the mustache yet so you can paint that separately and then attach it when basically everything is already finished. So the mustache is one of the almost last parts that you affix to the Phoenix's body. Again, beady black eyes, sparkling white teeth though, and uh, some nice fleshy tones. And yep, you don't want to get that angle. And from the bottom, I kept it a lot simpler. I just basically did this kind of dark red because it's basically in shadow. And so I'm trying to imitate light um, quite a bit when I'm painting this Phoenix. Oop, now it's upside down. But I still did touch up the bottom wings. So I added some light orange. I moved into the darker undertone that I had already originally did. And then black fingernails, because why not? Goth emo life, you know? So that is the Phoenix. That is probably the hardest miniature of this whole project. You can still see, that's the problem with some miniatures. You can still see some cracks and crevices and mold lines. Oh, maybe not mold lines, but you still see cracks from just my poor assembling. Um, but that's just the name of the game. And every miniature is slightly, is, is unique because you as the assembler uh, will put your own energy twist and kind of own uh, finesse into the assembly. So this Phoenix is truly mine and that makes it just so much more cool, unique, and uh, basically meaningful to me. So the connection that I've uh, established with these miniatures is just something else entirely that uh, no other board game has really given to me. And it's, it's really incredible that I've, I've grown to actually enjoy assembling these miniatures. I thought, like, whoa, um, they're really uh, uh, taking advantage of my uh, fanaticism for labor costs. But it's not free labor. It's really just part of the experience and something to be enjoyed rather than a, an entry fee. I mean, it very much is an entry fee to get started into this game. But it is, it is something truly to be savored once you really get into it. So... This is probably like maybe 50 pieces uh, to assemble this one monster that you fight. But then again, every single resource that you see on this evil bird is something that you can craft into something beautiful, amazing, and deadly in Kingdom Death. So, very cool and a very interesting quarry. I really want to fight him some more in the game, but there's just so many cool elements to Kingdom Death uh, that I hope you appreciate and I hope this video was helpful. So I hope you all enjoyed that and I hope that was helpful to all of you. Remember, if you are new to the channel, please remember to subscribe by hitting that red button down below as well as leaving a like if you so desire. So before we wrap up this video, I just want to give a huge shout out to Jesper Alteraki for joining us on Patreon. You can check out the link down below if you're not a patron. We do monthly live streams to talk about board games, Kickstarter, also dropping some insider info on the side. And I'll be releasing some patron-only videos once we hit 15 patrons on Patreon. So if you want to check out that link, it's a buck a month. It's totally optional. It's not mandatory to enjoy this channel. And if you're interested, everything is appreciated. So as always, thanks for watching everyone. Thanks for waiting. And now it's your turn. Mm -hmm.